Before we consider how sound is stored and processed by a computer, let's first consider what sound actually is and how it's captured. This is an abstract model of the air around us. In reality, the air molecules are not uniformly sized and spaced like this. And they're in a constant state of random motion even when there's no noise at all. Nevertheless, when a sound is made, perhaps by the clap of a pair of hands, a vibrating guitar string, or someone's voice, the air molecules nearby are disturbed. As each molecule collides with its nearest neighbours, a wave of alternating compressions and decompressions moves away from the source of the sound. On a dry day at 20 degrees Celsius, this longitudinal wave travels at a speed of 343 metres per second. To capture this sound, we can use a microphone. A dynamic microphone contains a magnet surrounded by a coil of copper wire, and attached to the coil is a thin membrane, a diaphragm. When a sound wave hits the diaphragm, the coil moves in relation to the magnet, and this induces an electrical current in the wire. This current can then be recorded somehow, and the sound played back later. If you plot a chart of the electrical current generated by a microphone versus time, you might see this classic representation of a sound wave. Again, you're looking at a simplified picture here. This sine wave is really just an approximation of what might be produced by a guitar string, for example. The distinctive sound of a note from a guitar owes itself to the many subtle overtones that are produced along with the primary sine wave. This is how the peaks and troughs of this graph relate to the positive and negative air pressures within the original compression wave. The maximum height of this graph is related to the number of molecules displaced by the original disturbance that created the sound. Or, to put it another way, the maximum height of this graph reflects the amount of compression at that point in time. The higher the level of compression, the louder the sound. This is the so-called amplitude. The distance between two adjacent peaks, two adjacent troughs, or to be more precise, the length of a single cycle, is known as the wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency of the sound, and hence the higher the pitch that you hear. Now let's consider how a computer goes about saving this information in a digital audio file. It's important to appreciate first that sound is an analogue phenomenon. In other words, its properties vary continuously. For example, at this point in time, the sound has a particular value for loudness. At this point in time, the value is smaller. It's quieter. Because this is an analogue wave, there are an infinite number of values of loudness in between the two. In other words, Loudness varies continuously. Not only that, but a sound wave can have a long wavelength, which means a low frequency, or a short wavelength, which means a high frequency. And it can have an infinite number of values for wavelength in between. So wavelength, and therefore frequency, also vary continuously. It's impossible for a computer to store an infinite number of values for loudness and frequency. So instead, the sound is sampled at regular intervals, and at each interval a numeric value for loudness is recorded. This results in a set of numbers. These numbers are a digital representation of the original wave. This sampling may be done while the sound is being captured, or it may be done while an analogue recording of the sound is being played back, perhaps from an old-style cassette tape or an LP record. A circuit known as an analogue-to-digital converter is used to do this. There's one of these behind the microphone socket on a typical computer. And, because we're talking about computers, let's not forget that these numbers are actually saved as binary numbers. When the digital recording is played back, the digital data in the sound file are used to recreate the original wave. The electrical signal generated can then be amplified and fed to a loudspeaker 
or headphones. But you can clearly see that what we have now is just an approximation of the original analogue waveform. This means that when the recorded sound is played back, it's not exactly the same as the original sound. The quality is not necessarily as good. To improve the quality of the recording, the original analogue wave can be sampled more frequently. In other words, we can increase the sample rate. You can see that when this sound wave is recreated from the data encoded with a higher sample rate, it's a much better approximation of the original analogue wave. Of course, if you double the sample rate, you may double the quality of the recorded sound, but you also double the amount of data that needs to be stored, resulting in a bigger sound file. Getting the balance right is important. In this example, you can see a wave with a much shorter wavelength and therefore a much higher frequency. If the sample rate is too low for this wave, not enough data will be captured when it's digitised, and the reconstructed wave will bear little resemblance to the original analogue wave. If the sample rate is too low, it will completely fail to capture the nature of high-frequency sounds. In order to capture a high-frequency sound with any degree of accuracy, the wave must be sampled at least twice per cycle. Sample rates are measured in samples per second, namely hertz. A typical sample rate is 8,000 times a second. That's 8,000 hertz, or 8 kilohertz. This is used for telephone calls and voice over internet data transmission. A sample rate of 8 kilohertz is often referred to as speech quality. With an audio CD, the sample rate is much higher, at 44,100 Hz, about 44 kilohertz. Although this is more than enough to cater for the sensitivity of most human ears, many people argue that the sound from an analogue recording, such as an LP record, has a much warmer quality than a CD. But the sample rate isn't the only thing that can affect the quality of digital sound. An equally important factor is the number of binary digits available to encode the loudness of each sample, the so-called bit depth. Suppose for a moment that there are only three bits available to encode the value of each sample. This means that each sample can have one of only eight possible values, ranging from 0 to 7. While the original analogue wave is being sampled, the analogue to digital converter has to decide which of these eight values to assign to each sample in a process called quantization. Each original value has to be rounded either up or down to a value that can be encoded using only three bits. The rounding errors that result from a low bit depth mean that the quality of the digital recording can be far removed from the original sound, even at a suitably high sample rate. What you see here, of course, is a rather extreme example. Most digital audio applications use a bit depth of 16 bits, so each sample can have one of 65,536 possible values. Needless to say, though, the higher the bit depth, the more data, and therefore the bigger the sound file. Audio applications for studio recording, mixing and mastering might use a bit depth of 24 bits, allowing for one of over 16.7 million possible values per sample. 32 bits per sample, that's over 4 billion possible values, is also available. The benefit of a high bit depth is much better precision while editing and a much bigger dynamic range. That is, the difference between the loudest and the quietest values possible. In summary, an analogue sound can be captured using a microphone. This converts the sound to an analogue electrical signal, which can be sampled and digitised. The quality of the digital sound depends on the number of samples taken per second, namely the sample rate. If the sample rate is too low, it may fail to record high-frequency sounds. The quality of the digital sound also depends on the bit depth 
the number of bits available to encode the loudness of each sample. If the bit depth is too low, measurements during sampling will be inaccurate, which will result in a fuzzy recording. You may also come across a figure known as the bit rate for a sound recording. This is the number of bits delivered per second during playback. The bit rate is easily calculated by multiplying the bit depth by the sample rate. If the sound has been recorded in stereo, then this is multiplied by the number of channels, which is usually two. Higher sample rates and bit depths result in digital recordings that are closer to the original sound, but this comes at a cost. Bigger file sizes. The most common raw uncompressed audio format is LPCM, which stands for Linear Pulse Code Modulation. This is the format used on audio CDs. You don't often see files with the LPCM extension because the raw audio data is normally contained within a wrapper file. These wrapper file formats include .wav, waveform audio file format, which was developed by Microsoft and IBM, and AIFF, audio interchange format, which is the Apple equivalent. One of the most well-known compressed sound formats is MP3, which can make a sound file up to 14 times smaller. MP3 is a lossy compression format because it removes data for sound beyond the normal hearing range of people and reduces the quality of sounds that are difficult to hear. Some people nevertheless argue that compressed digital sound is noticeably inferior to uncompressed sound. Indeed, some musicians have changed the way they produce music to work within the limitations of compressed formats like MP3. Perhaps in these days of high bandwidth and more discerning audiences, compressed music will eventually fall out of favour altogether.